Good morning. Uh, I'm Ken Lieberthal, uh, Senior Fellow Emeritus at Brookings. Uh, welcome to a uh, thorough examination of the outcomes, significant implications of the 19th Party Congress that we've all been following uh, avidly in the build-up and the, the actual uh, convening of the uh, Congress uh, uh, concluded about a week ago. Uh, this session is entitled uh, New Team, New Agenda? Question uh, mark. We now know that there clearly is a new team, uh, and we know the rundown on that team. The question is really, to my mind, uh, what does that new team say about uh, the uh, any changes in the agenda and the capacity to implement those changes uh, politically and administratively in China and in Chinese foreign policy. Uh, so we'll have a, a serious examination of the incoming uh, members of, or the new positions, incoming incumbents to positions in the Politburo uh, Standing Committee, the Politburo itself, the Central Committee, I believe at the provincial level also. Uh, and we all know what the uh, composition was and thrust of, was of Xi Jinping's political report uh, to the party congress. Uh, the press has made a great deal of that. We want to pick that apart to see how much continuity there really is. I think most specialists would say there's more continuity than the uh, press in the United States has uh, been aware of. Uh, but still also, uh, there are new elements and there are new emphases. And so we want to pick that apart in a variety of ways. This is divided into two, uh, 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 two components this morning. The first will be a uh, detailed analysis uh, by Chung Lee, uh, who is probably one of the most uh, well-known experts in the United States on Chinese uh, leadership changes, personalities, and their implications, uh, the groupings among leaders, uh, and uh, how they are chosen, what their constraints are, and so forth. And so uh, Chung will give his analysis of the incoming uh, cohort of the 19th Party Congress and some of the implications of the choices that were made. Uh, and then we'll move to a panel. Uh, the panel will be uh, moderated by Susan Lawrence. And that will look more at a breakdown of substantive areas of policy and what we can expect, how much we know from this, and what the core issues are going forward. Uh, for each of these, we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, Chung will speak for about 35 minutes, and then we'll uh, have questions from the audience. I know Susan plans to allow a fair amount of audience uh, time uh, in the second panel. So. Uh, to maximize the time that you will have at the end of each of these uh, sets of remarks, let me ask Chung Lee to come up to the uh, podium. Thank you. Thanks, Ken, for that uh, generous introduction. I'm not only honored by your presence here today, but also profoundly grateful for your mentorship and the friendship for all these years that uh, at the Brookings and also prior to your arrival here. When I came to the United States about 30 some years ago, and I actually was, I was already old at that time, you were already a distinguished professor at the Michigan. I was so fortunate to study directly and indirectly under you, as well as Barbara Scalpino, Doka Burnett, who was also your teacher, and Michael Ausenberg, Lynn White, Ezra Vogel, among others. Intellectual inquiry is like the formation of a wave. Each succeeding wave owns its momentum to the strength of those that went before. Thank you, Ken, for your pioneering role in contributing to what we now call, what we used to call, Pekingology. Uh, the careful empirical study of the inner working of the Chinese top uh, leadership. I hope my presentation today reflects the great American academic tradition 
in this important field. I also hope, as I become really old, that uh, young people, whether in China or in the United States, and continue to pay attention to individual leaders, their background, how their background translate to their uh, uh, views and the policies. Now, I also want to thank the speakers who will be participating on the panel today. Uh, Ambassador uh, Roy, Richard, Susan, and my colleague, Davey, for sharing your expertise and insights um, with us. Your perspectives have all, always challenged and broadened my views and understanding of China. And thank you. And also thank you all for coming. Now, in my 30 five minutes or so, I will talk about the four issues. First, share with you the research methodology. Then uh, talk about uh, what I believe that uh, the main findings. Uh, and thirdly, uh, discuss about the rising elite groups. And uh, finally, and uh, probably most importantly, talk about policy implications. Now let me talk about the research methodology for a few minutes. Now there's a conventional wisdom of perception, uh, largely in the outside world, to a certain extent in China as well, about the Chinese political leadership. It's a rigid, opaque, ineffective. Now of course there's some truism for each and every one of them. But I think that uh, Susan Shirk Professor at the UC San Diego once said, he probably, she probably not referred to this, but she said, I remember that uh, sentence. Uh, cynicism, like a dogmatism, could be, can be an uh, excuse for intellectual laziness. So I think these three views could be highly misleading when you come to analyze Chinese elite politics. Now, these are the speculations before the Congress, and now we can see the result. The five widely spread speculation within China and outside China. The first is that she will be elevated to chairman of the party, not the chairman of the PRC, as we know he is already chairman of the pre uh, president of the PRC, we sometimes call Zhu Xi, Xi Zhu Xi. But he is referred to the party chairman, which only Mao uh, had that title a long time ago. So currently Xi Jinping is a general secretary, so the argument is that or the speculation said that Xi Jinping will elevate his position from general secretary to chairman. Certainly, it's not true. And I, I actually think that never was in the agenda. Even ne never thought about that, anyone. Second is the one is Xi Jinping thought. It is, it is really added to the CCP constitution, elevated. Uh, like make him the third person his name is mentioned after Mao and Deng. Although Zhang Zemin's three represents and uh, Hu Jintao's scientific development also in the party constitution, nevertheless, Jiang's name, Hu Jintao's name was not in the, were not in the party constitution, but Xi Jinping now made it in his first term. Now the third one is this, uh, Wang Jisan, uh, you know, the anti corruption czar, the argument said he will remain in the Power Blue Standing Committee. Not happen. I personally think it never was in the, in the discussion. Now, Wang Jisan may still play some important role, but he could not violate the norm and the regulations in terms of age requirement. So in the past two years, you can see that I have been consistent saying that Wang Jisan will step down. The third one is that, uh, the fourth one is the, is the uh, speculation that the Xi Jinping may find a successor. My view was 50-50, but eventually it did not happen. And finally, that there's an argument that Xi Jinping now has become so powerful, should a power bureau standing committee, the most important leadership body, should all by his people, and that did not happen. So it's so-called a winner's take all. Now, of course, prediction is important. I'm also in that business. But usually, I hesitate to predict exactly the name, but to provide the candidates. This is the list I provided two weeks before the party congress. 12 candidates for the Power Bureau Standing Committee. The checks that was later we added after the result announced. So seven, all seven of them made it to the list. The other five all made it to the Power Bureau, which is a body of 25 people. So not too bad. 
But uh, more importantly, a year ago, exactly a year ago, October 17, I gave a speech at the UBC and, uh, in Vancouver, University of British Columbia. I made uh, several predictions. And when you talk about Xi Jinping's policy, you see, see most of them made it to the Power Bureau and even Standing Committee. Li Zhansu, Zhao Leji, Li Xi, and uh, uh, Zhang Youxia, Liu He, and Chen Xi, and et cetera. You see the list. Most of them are already in the Power Bureau Standing Committee now and, uh, and the Power Bureau as well, with a couple of uh, uh, exceptions. Also in that presentation, a year ago, I made a prediction these are the top nine candidates for Power Bureau Standing Committee. Now, of course, Hu Chunghua did not make it. Sun Zhenzhai is in jail. <laughs> but look at the top seven people. Look at the top seven people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Someone said that probably you talked to Xi Jinping a year ago. They got that list. Now, of course, that, uh, I personally never use the ins inside the stories, and I'm very cynical about the inside the story. So all my research is based on the database I started to create 30 years ago under the guidance by later Bob Scarpino at Berkeley. That database, uh, that uh, result is presented in my book published a year ago. Uh, basically, I have the 30,000 Chinese elites uh, in that database. This is the leaders usually uh, controlled or nominated, approved by the Central Organization Department, Zhong Zhu At a certain time, about 4,000 people. So that the database is about that. So the, uh, the book has actually 84 charts and tables and uh, uh, about the Chinese, uh, 200 Chinese uh, terminologies. And most importantly, it's the last one. It's 600 Chinese leaders, 500 of them are current leaders. Now, so it's not that lack of transparency if I can get right a year ago about the, the seven power bureau standing committee. What I did is just uh, I used the rules. I probably very few people really believe these rules and these norms, these regulations. People are so cynical. Of course, I also look at the factional politics, look at the check and balance, need the check and balance, look at their career trajectory. These are the things help me to identify the rising stars. I cannot say for 100% sure. It, um, it's kind of lucky I got the seven people right in the top seven, right? But certainly the other two also tell us we should be humble, right? And because a lot of things is beyond our analysis, only insiders who know, you know, very small number of people. Now, so my research is really focused on not only just Xi Jinping, of course not, but the, look at the seven member power rule standing committee and also 25 member power bureau. But most importantly in my database, it's about 376 leaders. These are the uh, leaders I will discuss. Now let's move to the main findings. This is the, the six most important leadership bodies. First is the Central Committee, and the 76 of them are new. 76% are new. Yellow is the new members. And in the anti-corruption body, 133 members. And only 10 of them uh, uh, were in the pa past com commission. So it's about the 93% are new. The so-called secretary, these are the, like the chief of staff office, control the flow of information, decide which leader, which to which country, travel to which country, uh, which foreign delegate, uh, uh, you know, head of state come, who should participate in the meeting. This is the, the, uh, the, uh, also the flow of the documents. Very, very important body. Seven people, 100% are new. And uh, Power Bureau, as we uh, now know, um, 15 of the members are new. Only 10 stay, 60%. And the Power Bureau Standing Committee, Five out of seven are new. And uh, CMC, Central Military Commission, is probably the uh, more, uh, less uh, uh, new members. But I will discuss, actually, ironically, Central Military Commission has the fastest, uh, uh, the military leaders has the fastest turnover rate uh, uh, we are going to see. Uh, it's already happened. Now, this is the turnover rate, the Central Committee, it's nothing new. You look at the from 1982, I mean, always maintain that on average is 62%. Now, I should make it clear, this also includes the other members promoted to the full members also considered new.
But if you do not consider include that, we will be roughly 10% less. So uh, could be like a 60, 60 percent, you know, turnover rate in terms of entirely new body. But usually, all the previous uh, studies all include this uh, from outer to promoted to central. So this party congress, 19th party congress, is has the fastest, highest growth I mean, turnover rate since 1969 during the Cultural Revolution. Now this is the Power Bureau Standing Committee. Uh, before the turnover, two people stay. Five people promoted. These are the five new members. Uh, these are the seven members I predicted a year ago. Now, let's look at their factional identity. It's very, very interesting. This is very, very important. You, I mean, not instead of winner takes all, and uh, two, I mean, Xi Jinping has a three, including himself, uh, especially Li Zhansu and the Zhao Leji. These are very powerful figures. And uh, they formed a uh, kind of a very close relationship for many decades. But uh, uh, Wang Funying and, uh, and Han Zhen, as we know, both of them advanced their career from Shanghai. And both of them graduated the same university I graduated, East China Normal University in Shanghai. And uh, they have the reputation as a Shanghai gang. Of course, that, uh, you can imagine Zhang Zemin really worked very hard to let, make sure these two people made it to the Power Bureau Standing Committee. Of course, they are political allies for Xi Jinping, but they are not protégés by Xi Jinping per se. Right? Now, two others, Li Keqiang and, uh, and Wang Yang, these people advanced their career from the Chinese Communist Youth League, uh, which often the Chinese called the Tuan Pai. These are the protégés of Hu Jintao. So that's a very important composition. So five years ago, Xi Jinping has a six versus one dominance of the 18th Party Congress. Now, actually, one person less. And Wang Yang is a very ambitious man. Remember, five years ago, he fought vigorously with Bo Xilai at that time with a different model of development. So that's the new composition. That's very, very important. Although Wang Yang probably does not have the, uh, uh, his position as the chairman of the CCPCC, as I'm going to say, it's not that uh, uh, critically important. But whoever in the Power Bill Standing Committee is important. Now, why that happen? This all follows these norms and the rules I mentioned in my book. And uh, one is the age requirement. These, uh, those born before 1950, disqualify for the membership of the 19th Party Congress, the 19th Central Committee. If you're not Central Committee, you could not be Power Bureau, you could not be Power Bureau Standing Committee. And uh, five years ago, the age limit was 1945. And five years early, it's uh, uh, 1940. So that age requirement is so solid. That's the reason why I predict Xi, uh, Wang Jisan will leave the Power Bureau Standing Committee. Second is term limits. No more than two five-year terms in the same position and the three five-year terms at the same level of leadership. This is usually referred to important positions, not the ceremonial positions. And thirdly, regional bureaucratic representation. Each province has two, four membership seats, with the only exception of Xinjiang and Tibet could have three or four, but all uh, other 29 provincial level entities, just the two, usually party secretary and the governor or mayor. Now, immediately after the party congress, they can rotate, but during that time, it's by, by their uh, uh, region. No more than two, no less than two. And also the military leadership. Previously, five years ago, it's 41 full members, 25 alternate members. This time, it's exactly the same number. And finally, there's more candidates than seats election. Now, China is no democracy, but China does have an election. It's a limited election to choose the alternate members. So basically, four members, you elect 204, but there are 222 candidates, so 80 8.8% eliminated. The same thing with alternate members. You elect, uh, you elect 176, but you put 189 candidates on the ballot. So 9.9%, .9%, almost 10% eliminated. Those who eliminated including Wang Weiguang, the president of the CAS, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and uh, Song Pu Xuan was the commander, uh, uh, the chief person 
in the uh, uh, 60th anniversary parade in Beijing. It's a really military confident for Xi Jinping. And finally, Chen Lei uh, is a cabinet member, minister of water resources. They were all eliminated for various reasons. Just examples. Now, the age composition of the entire Central Committee, these 376 people, is quite interesting. Most of them uh, belong to the 19, uh, born 1950s or 1960s. And uh, there are only two people born in 1970. And there's a few people unknown. And so this is the age composition. So sixth generation is in the waiting. Uh, they already start to dominate the provincial level leadership. But in the national leadership, they still share power with those who were born in the 1950s. Now very quickly to see the, the composition, likely composition of the state council. As we know, that the party leadership change already completed. But the state leadership will be announced in March. But I think transition already start. So these are the expected the, the members, executive members of the cabinet. Li Keqiang will remain as premier. Han Zheng will be executive vice premier. And uh, other vice premier, including Hu Chunhua, who just left Guangdong. And uh, Sun, Chun, uh, Sun Chun Lai, she will replace Liu Yandong. She's the only woman, uh, a power bureau member. And Liu He, uh, many of outside people who know Liu He very well, who was a uh, chief economic advisor for Xi Jinping, highly likely he will become vice premier. Of course, they say there's also a chance that he may replace Wang Funing as the director of, foreign, uh, director of policy planning. But most people, uh, I believe that Liu He will be vice premier. There will be several state councillor. Uh, but before that, also Yang Jiechi's position is still not announced yet. Previously, the person in charge of foreign affairs only got the position as state councillor, the next level. But the Yang Jiechi now made through power bureau. This is the first time for the past 35 years or 40 years. Previously, only one foreign policy person, Chen Qishen, made through power bureau. So after 30 some years, Yang Jiechi got that position. I'm going to comment on the significance later on. But the, his position is not entirely clear. Uh, uh, I also believe he could be, even could be a candidate to vice president of PRC, uh, help Xi Jinping to see foreign delegates. But again, this is purely guess. There's no insider information because I don't know where to put him if not the vice premier of the, of the state council. Uh, so these are the, now the military leaders, four of them are returning members. Only three are new. This is very much expected. But they give, this gives you the impression early on that the military turnover is uh, not significant, but it's not true. Now, for the only six military generals who are four members are returning members out of 41 four members. So basically, 85 of the military members are new in the Central Committee. This is very significant. And in some other country, you can see this like a military coup. You know, never happened before. But the only six out of 70, uh, 41 are returning members. These are the, uh, the six generals. Now, let me very quickly mention about Xi Jinping's power base, how Xi Jinping can consolidate the power in uh, other levels of leadership except the Power Bureau Standing Committee. Uh, he, Xi Jinping, as you know, is well connected. Unlike some leaders, either just have a base in the coast region or in the inland region. And Xi Jinping has both. And also, some leaders just identify as the world to do, also called princeling. He is princeling, but also he can reach out through grassroots because of his formative experience and et cetera. So that makes Xi Jinping is well-rounded in so many ways. Now, he is a princeling, so he has a lot of friends in the second generation of the communist red nobility, so-called the Taizi Dang. And he has strong ties with San Xi Gan, and including his father's revolutionary experience, including he spent six or seven years when he was a teenager uh, as a so-called center down youth during the Cultural Revolution, and also including some of the provincial leaders in Shanxi. Also, Xi Jinping has a lot of protégés in the four provinces he served as a leader, starting with Hebei, then Fujian, and Zhejiang, and finally Shanghai. And also, Xi Jinping served as two years as a secretary, Mi Su, for DOD secretary or minister. That also made some connection with the military leaders. And also, he graduated from Tsinghua. As both undergraduate and PhD, he has some good friends. 
uh, in Tsinghua. And finally, he has a lot of misu uh, in his career. So he promotes them also very vigorously. Now, this is the revised list. The early on, I show in the uh, UBC, but this is a revised one. You can see uh, from these years in Sanxi, Li Zhansu Zhaoji became Power Bureau Standing Committee. Li Xi, Zhang Youxia, Wang Chen became Power Bureau. And in Beijing, in his childhood years, and also uh, um, it's uh, really related with Liu He and uh, Chen Xi, and uh, his roommate at the Tsinghua, and now become the organization uh, head, department head. In Fujian years, Cai Qi, that later uh, promoted to be party, Beijing party secretary, and uh, Wang Kunming, uh, he is the uh, uh, propaganda czar now. And uh, in Zhejiang, Chen Ming'er, and uh, could be one of the successors. And uh, Li Chang now just moved to Shanghai uh, to be party secretary of Shanghai just uh, a week, uh, a few days ago. And also in Shanghai, Xi Jinping worked for the eight or uh, seven or eight months. He also uh, made some strong connections, although some may not be his protege, but uh, uh, he actually tried to promote some of them. Let's start with Han Zhen, at least he uh, get along reasonably well. And the Ding Xuexiang and the Yang Xiaodu, both are in the power bureau. Now, this is Xi Jinping's power base. Now, usually when we look at Chinese politics, we consider Xi Jinping versus Tuan Pai. He purged a lot of them, put a lot of them in jail. And the, the Tuan Pai, this is the chart tell us the rise and the fall of Tuan Pai. So last party Congress, Tuan Pai had 96 members. Yellow is the alternate. Blue is more important, four members. Now, um, only 35, uh, significantly reduced, although still there, and, uh, but the significant reduced. Now, this is the one chart I made with my uh, research assistant uh, about uh, three or four months ago to look at uh, uh, under Hu Jintao, the Tuan Pai leaders in the provincial chief, you know, governors, provincial party secretary, rise dramatically, then start to decline after, she, after who, uh, a few years after Hu, Hu Jintao retired. Now, what's the point of this chart? I think it's quite revealing. It tells you there's nothing unusual for Xi Jinping to promote his own people. Hu Jintao did, did it very quietly. And, uh, and uh, probably Hu Jintao did not have too many enemies. He did not have this kind of large uh, purges, but he did the same thing. I and mean, with his people moved to the uh, important positions. Uh, now let me talk about the third issues, the elite, rising elite groups. Now this is uh, the dramatic rise and the fall of the so-called technocrats, meaning engineers turned politicians. And uh, in the 15th and the 16th party congress reached the peak, the seven or nine members of the Power Bureau Standing Committee, they are all engineers. Remember Jiang Zemin, Zhu Rongji, I mean, Li Pen, and, uh, and uh, et cetera, and Wen Jiabao and, uh, and Hu, Jing, uh, Hu Jintao. They are all engineers by training. That period came to an end. And this party congress, zero for the Power Bureau Standing Committee. Two, and, uh, namely Chen Xi, uh, graduate from Tsinghua, and Ding Xuexiang, his former chief of staff. These are two Power Bureau members had an engineering degree. This is based on the highest degree he counted. So that's a change. So this has also happened. The entire Central uh, Committee, those technocrats, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, in 1980s, very, very small, only Li Pen, and was at the Central Committee. But the rapid rise then start to decline. Now it's the lowest, uh, six, uh, 17 percent. And uh, instead, those who study social sciences, particularly economics, start to rise. And uh, believe it or not, and those who study law also start to increase. And uh, now it's the highest in the 18% in the Central Committee, four members. And those who study social sciences, humanities, and uh, also economics uh, rise to 48%. Now, another important thing is previously, if you wanted to be top leader, you want to power bureau or power bureau standing committee, you almost must serve as the provincial chief, especially provincial party secretary. Now that requirement does start to reduce significantly, uh, decline. So only, only 15 out of 25 had such experience. Instead, you see, you see some new groups start to emerge. 
One is example is I described in my book, so-called Cosmos Club. The leaders advance their career from aerospace industry. Just look at these eight people. I will not be surprised in 10 years, one of them will become China's premier, and uh, if they are young enough. And uh, so these are people already in charge of Guangdong and Zhejiang, and in charge of Liaoning and Heilongjiang, and in charge of important uh, uh, bureaucracies. And uh, uh, they are well experienced in the business world and serve as a CEO of the aerospace industries or you know, China's aircraft company uh, for many years. And uh, I will talk about the implications. And many of them speak very good English. In the case of uh, Yuan Jiajun, um, he speaks flawless English. Uh, I was told, I never met him, but uh, some of the mutual friends told me uh, about uh, 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 that's a very impressive guy. Now, also, the Cosmo Club also includes some current leaders. These are all the Central Committee members or alternates among these 376. When you have this kind of so many, um, you need that Xi Jinping want to emphasize that industry. So industrial policy will apply <laughs> for these people. But at the same time, uh, these are very competent leaders in their own rights. Another trend is university presidents start to be very important group in the Chinese leadership. These include those former university presidents and party secretaries, including deans like uh, Wang Funing, served the dean at the law school at Fudan. And uh, so these people, including uh, Chen Jinying, the mayor, mayor of Beijing, he got his PhD from London and previously served as party uh, president of Tsinghua University and also the minister of environment protection. Now he moved to the frontier, very important position as mayor of Beijing. Now these are the current party uh, secretaries or presidents and uh, also made it to the Central Committee. And uh, again, it's a significant list of the people and uh, particularly pay attention to Chen Xu. She is a rising star. There are not so many women leaders made it to the Central Committee, but uh, she uh, in few years could be very, very important uh, figure in Chinese politics. Now, we talk about the retainees, foreign educated retainees uh, foreign HP leader uh, uh, people who return to China and uh, then become leaders. This is the increase of percentage. Uh, my forecast is 17%, but actually 2% more uh, than I uh, anticipated. So it's uh, basically every five central community members, almost one of them, study abroad as a degree candidate and as a visiting scholar. And uh, some of them uh, got a very impressive, I mean, I'm, I'm going to explain, but uh, most of them um, uh, study in the United States. Overwhelming majority of them study in the United States. Now, these are the four power bureau members. And uh, Wang Funing uh, studied at UC Berkeley as a visiting scholar, University of Iowa. Actually, Barbara Scalapino, I mentioned my mentor, was also his host at Berkeley. Okay, and um, the Liu He got his PH, um, MPA from Harvard Kennedy School. And Chen Xi, two years visiting scholar at Stanford. And Yang Jiezi spent a lot of time uh, as a young man in uh, UK, including London School of Economics. Now, talk about policy implications very quickly. I want to cover three areas. One is foreign policy, one is economic policy, one is political initiative. I am a strong believer new leaders mean new policies because leaders want to do something different, want to deliver. China is a big country. So Still unclear where they will deliver, but uh, let me give you some uh, my speculations in this regard. Foreign policy team, you probably will see a certain degree of continuity, but their role enhance, enhance dramatically. Remember, five years ago, China's military insulted foreign ministry, thinking you are, you are grand, 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 grandson, a Chinese decision making circle. Remember that quote by some people, but now Yang Jiezi represent the importance of foreign policy and the Xi Jinping's, uh, with Xi Jinping's support. Now, these, uh, are the, this is a new team. We do not know their position yet. The second most important person will be Song Tao, who currently is the Minister of International Department at the Central Committee. Also, Liu Jiei will, be, will uh, 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 be very important in the Taiwan affairs. And uh, Wang Yi will remain, but his position is still unclear. There's also two rising stars and uh, Le Yuchen and also Zheng Zheguang. 
And uh, the, Zheng Zeguang is the only person in my presentation today is not a central committee member. All other people I mentioned, you see the photos are central committee member or high, but uh, because of Zheng Zeguang is important. And um, he, uh, uh, I just mentioned him. Now, the economic team will be these six people headed by uh, Han Zheng and, uh, and also Liu He will play a very, very important role from the advisor to policy makers. And uh, along with the He Li Feng, the director of NDRC, Zhong San, the Minister of Commerce, and Yi Gang, we still do not know which position. We still do not know which person will replace Zhou Xiaochuan. And, uh, but no matter what, Yi Gang will be a crucial figure. And uh, also Mu, Yong, uh, uh, Mu Hong, very few people know him, but he is a very important figure for Xi Jinping on economic policies. The photos, at, uh, yeah, he looks young, but he's not that young in terms of age, yes. Now, let me say that's important, this is important. I want to very quickly. Xi Jinping control Beijing, Hebei, and Tianjin corridor. That will be very, very important to him. Remember, Xiong'an will be the third economic special zone. He really want to push for that. So these people are all his protégés. And uh, 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 Tianjin mayor, just moved to Hebei, become Hebei party secretary just a few days ago. And uh, this is the team. Meanwhile, that Xi Jinping also firmly in charge of three major provincial entities, namely Shanghai, Guangdong, and Chongqing. These are all dominated by his confidence. So when you have these places, I mean, the whole economy is already decided. So I will talk about the policy implications just in a second. Now let's talk about policy implications. Under Xi Jinping's second term, China will have a new urban development strategy, which means, for example, Beijing, the, a lot of places, a lot of functions will be changed, will be moved out. Beijing only remains as a political center, international center, cultural and innovation, technology innovation center. All other functions, including economic function, industrial function, and education function will move out. So that. Uh, it's a new strategy for development. The same strategy will happen to Shanghai, Guangdong, different ways, different model will be, I don't, because of time, I don't, time limits, I will not have time to discuss. Also, modern equipment, modern manufacturing, this is the reason why he promoted so many people from aerospace and from the shipbuilding. And uh, so that's the emphasis of China. Now, here is a mix for business communities. We will hear some positive news like the green consumption, like a service sector development, like the uh, promotion about the new resource, uh, uh, new energy, and the new service sectors, and etc. These are good for U.S. business. But you can also see these people uh, could be quite nationalistic, could be quite protectionist. So it's not one dimensional. It depends on how you look at the issues. And also, there's a politically, there's some new initiative. I wanted to finish just one minute. Uh, he, uh, Xi Jinping and the party leadership decided to establish a central leading group on the rule of law. And also, they believe or not, they talk about the constitutional review system. This is the things dissidents and the human rights lawyers argue for a long time, but now it's party, it's already accepted party's decision. And finally, establishment of the National Supervision Commission very much similar to what happened in Hong Kong. It's a more institutional method to fight corruption rather than the previous five years, the campaign method. Now, there's so many people promoted in the, with solid legal background to important positions. And uh, so let me finish with the things that actually I mentioned almost a year ago in another speech here at the Brookings. This is also an epigraph, one of the epigraphs I use for my book. I use it because Xi Jinping used the same Chinese saying in two occasions. Uh, this is Chinese called the Xiao Zi, Zi Si, Zhong Zi Yong Ren, Da Zi Li Fa. A friend of mine helped me translate. Limited wisdom makes doers. Moderate wisdom makes managers. Superior wisdom makes law builders. We don't know whether Xi Jinping will surprise again, us again for one more time as he did five years ago with a, a drastic anti-corruption campaign with military reform, with China's one built one road, how he will use the capital, whether it be real change in the institutional development, we do not know. Certainly, I hope so. Thank you very much. For more things, buy my book.
Uh, Chung, thank you very much for a masterful overview of, of the changes that occurred in personnel uh, and their backgrounds, and you know, just kind of chock full of data. By the way, will your slide presentation be available afterwards on the web? No. No. But okay. the video will be available, I believe, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, then I, I, I hope people took good notes uh, yes. very quickly. Uh, we only have 15 minutes left in this session. I just want to ask you one question and then open up to, to the group. Uh, the, one of the major themes of the uh, party Congress and Xi's speech uh, was the increase in the role of the party itself at all levels of the system. Uh, ongoing anti-corruption and supervision efforts to assure discipline within the party uh, and unity of thought in the party uh, and politics as a politics in the sense of supporting the center and agreeing with the center's program as being a critical element for promotion. Uh, how have the incentives for local leaders to uh, creatively implement the wide-ranging set of substantive issues that are on the docket, have those incentives evolved? Uh, it clearly was a complaint in the first uh, five years of the C leadership uh, that local leaders, and especially at municipal and county and township levels where the rubber meets the road, uh, that local leaders often proved to be very timid uh, because of the corruption campaign uh, the incentives have kind of turned against uh, being creative, dynamic, and, and changing the way things worked at the local level. Uh, what do you expect from this, or is it uh, too early to get a sense of how incentives are shifting at the locality? It's not too early. It's a, uh, it's a good question. Previously five years, because these local leaders, local meaning provincial or major cities, it's a, it's a major entities, for example, you know, Guangdong, Shandong, um, Henan, and what else? That the Sichuan, I mean, the population is surpassed the, 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 the Germany with the highest, with the largest population in Europe. So this kind of entities, in terms of GDP, you know, Guangdong is ranked with the states like Mexico, uh, 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 number 15. So these are gigantic entities. These leaders, they should have their own incentive. But the past five years, these leaders are, most of them, as I mentioned, 45% were Fu Jintao's protégés. I think at least six or seven are later arrested on the corruption charges. Of course, they did not have incentive to do anything. Of course, they, they, they wanted to resist some of the policies. Right. But now with Xi Jinping's people well positioned, so that dynamic starts to change. And uh, they have their incentive uh, to carry out much needed reform. And, uh, but they also have Xi Jinping's blessing. I don't think Xi Jinping wants to put uh, investors uh, I mean, corruption on these people. No. I mean, they already went through some of the kind of scrutiny. That also explains some of the Xi Jinping's policy cannot make to the Central Committee. But of course, this is, I, I don't, I'm not saying that uh, there will be no corruption involved. But it's a different game. It's a different kind of leaders. And with a different kind of background, with different kind of motivation, with different kind of connection with a new leader. Uh, so it's they are motivated to deliver. So we will see uh, very quickly some changes, uh, some initiative. And uh, maybe I'm naive. Uh, fail to understand difficulties. But again, as the Chinese leaders, these new, new leaders, they certainly uh, very clearly understand what they want to deliver. One thing that actually is quite bizarre, if you look at their bios, there's a, all leaders add one thing. It's your head of a river or head of rivers in the province. Tsai Chi, for example, he has only, he has two titles. One is the party secretary of Beijing. This is before the Party Congress. He does not have any membership, etc. The other, he's the head of the rivers in Beijing. Now, why rivers? Because Xi Jinping said that any provincial leader should be responsible for environment for the lakes and rivers in their region. So they all added to that in the bios. You look at the People's Daily or Xinhua News. They, they become, I mean, that's a clear message that not only GDP grows, but also environment is also another criteria to test you. So China's economic growth model already profoundly changed. So the strategies I mentioned uh, is the things they will emphasize. This give uh, foreign companies, like in the United States or Europe, great opportunity, but also could be uh, another uh, level of challenge. 
Okay, let's open it up. Uh, I'm going to ask you, when, when I recognize you, to wait for the microphone to come. Uh, please, you know, give your name and uh, affiliation and then uh, direct the question in the form of a question, please, uh, given limited time. And why don't we start over here? Could you try one more time? Sorry. While you're working on that, let, let's. Is that uh, it my, works. Oh, it works now? Okay, fine. Okay, first, thanks, Professor, for giving us this speech. It's really great. Um, I'm Qi Fan from uh, Johns Hopkins University. And um, my question has two parts, you know, which is a good um, way of raising actually two questions. The first question is. Um, I've seen a lot of newspaper titles calling Xi Jinping as like um, um, the return of Mao, and I was uh, hoping to uh, hear more about your view on that. And the second is like in the speech you mentioned a lot about like analyzing their policy perspective from like their bio, their backgrounds, uh, and I was wondering like um, what's the um, uh, like. With regard to Guo Shuqing's background, do you think there was like more fintechs in China in the near future? Thanks. Uh, very quickly, the first one certainly got a lot of attention, but I just want to emphasize uh, Mao is Mao was Mao because of the environment. Xi Jinping um, should be himself because of a new completely different environment. I mean, you, you cannot make that comparison without a look at the environment. Uh, and, um, the, during the Mao time, uh, some people, I grew up during, during that period, we would condemn our parents and think Mao was right. But how many people today think their parents were wrong, Xi Jinping was right? No, seriously. I mean, it's not that mood. So I don't think that comparison um, is fair and uh, is legitimate. And uh, yes, there's some components that's worrisome. Yes, there's a personality cut. Yes, there's a tight political control. Uh, but the question is whether this is temporary or long term. I certainly think it's temporary. I mean, if he does not change, the society, the other forces will force him to change. This is my, the view might differ from others. Now, you talk about Guo Su uh, about think tank. Is that your question? About the role of think tank? What? Financial. Oh, financial. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, uh, I'm sorry that I did not uh, include the uh, pure financial team. I just mentioned that it's still unclear that who will replace Zhou Xiaochuan. And uh, a week ago, I heard that uh, they haven't decided yet. And, uh, but you do see the candidates, you know, Liu Siyu, Guo Suqing, and uh, uh, Chang Liang and Yi Gang. These are the four candidates. My colleague, Paul David, will tell you better, I mean, better assessment. Each of them has strengths, each of them has weakness. And, uh, but uh, no matter what, all these four people play an important role in the financial development. Now, one issue area China is extremely uh, concerned is the financial instability or financial risk. And uh, uh, so you mentioned about why things are not delivered uh, during the past five years as the Xi Jinping promised in third platinum. Of course, first, I think that uh, it's largely true that it's not fully delivered, but I cannot say it's nothing happened. It's something important happened. Service sector was up. I mean, domestic consumption is up. Innovation actually become one of the driving forces for China's economy, which has really surprised all, many of us, including myself. Um, but uh, largely not delivered because of the leadership is not in a good position, Xi Jinping's own people not in good position, other people worry that they will be purged and that they could not understand what Xi Jinping in mind, etc. And also the priorities for Xi Jinping is anti-corruption, military reform, etc. But the, uh, and also there's a global financial uncertainty with the, what happened in the UK, what happened in the United States. They gotta be careful. But ultimately, they understand that China need to reform that sector. I think Donald Trump uh, has a good reason to push for that change the service sector veteran, particular financial liberalization. Sooner or later, China will do, but we do not have a timetable. Hopefully, that should be sooner rather than late. And, uh, but uh, all these leaders, I think they are 
relatively speaking, I certainly don't buy that these are reformers, these are reformers, these are conservatives. And I think in certain cases, they're all reformers. In some cases, they're all conservatives. But at least there are some people more familiar with the market, more market oriented. So in that case, actually, I'm, I'm actually quite happy with people like Wu Ruqing, like Liu He, like Liu Siyu, and the other. Thank you. Uh, over here. Oh, thank you. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, consultant. Uh, it's very interesting what you said about the uh, Central Military Commission. Now, in my understanding, there's been a major restructuring of the Central Military Commission. And, of course, also, just within the past couple of years, they created their, what they're calling their National Security Commission. And it's a little bit hard to in, find information about that. So how do these major restructurings fit in with this uh, uh, big change that you're talking about, and in, 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 in particularly in relation to Xi? What do you say? All true. Uh, Xi Jinping really uh, did remarkable well in this area. The military reform has three objectives. First is to change China's military um, uh, uh, development model, uh, shifting from Russian model, which emphasizes on army, to a joint operation with emphasis on Navy and Air Force. This is number one. Number two, a very much American model This they want to pursue. And number two is to, uh, uh, to restructure previously the four greater departments you know, political, logistic, and uh, um, uh, equipment, and chief of staff. They really hijacked the Central Military Commission, especially the civilian leader. They are the decision makers. They are the uh, one particular layer between the Central Military Commission and uh, reach out to whether the services or operation. But Xi Jinping makes these four departments marginalized, become four out of 15. So instead, he directly control. Uh, the services, services meaning that the Army, Navy, Air Force, I mean, uh, uh, strategic force, and also ROC forces, and uh, also now people's armed police. But at the same time, directly control the five operation theaters. So this is what he achieved. This is number two objective. That explains that the Central Military Commission, the members previously is representative for Army and also Air Force, but they're all gone. So you see that kind of layout and reduce the numbers. And uh, thirdly is to promote young guards, you know, uh, in Chinese, two important positions. That explains that the 85% of turnover. So that's what he achieved. Just have time for one more quick question, and let's go back there. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Li. Thank you uh, for your wonderful and uh, detailed speech. And my, uh, I'm from China News Service. Uh, my question is about uh, Mr. Trump's visit. We know that he will visit China uh, next week, and he's the first foreign leader to visit China after the 19th National Congress. So what's your expectation of it? And uh, uh, there's a view that uh, because the two countries now has too many differences on many issues such as trade and uh, um, North Korea, so it's impossible to expect some positive outcome of his visit. Uh, do you agree with it? Thank you. Well, I think both leaders will announce it's successful. Otherwise, they will not pursue that. But uh, the real thing is whether you can uplift the, the confidence of business community in both countries. That's crucial. Because at least you need to make a business community. Wall Street, major companies in the United States think that the China's market is not close. And uh, uh, foreign companies really, I mean, not so much go back to the 1990s. That's not realistic. At that time, China desperately needed foreign investment. But at least, as Xi Jinping promised, should be equal, should be fair, should be real open should have an equal market access. The same thing, Chinese business uh, companies want Donald Trump to say that you will not use CFIUS to prevent Chinese companies to enter. And, uh, but I think there's an opportunity uh, for, uh, uh, because the, both economies are so large, and we have two experts, I mean, Richard and David can talk about the economic matters later on. But very quickly, I think that, uh, despite the, the challenges, the tensions, because China become more and more uh, uh, competent, or China think that they have more leverage, that actually become a problem. I think Xi Jinping said that rightly, he said that we should make cake bigger. So whether they really can make cake bigger, this is another thing that I hope that uh, this visit can deliver some of the things. Not in the real substance, not in terms of just, uh, just empty words. Now, the secondly is the, certainly probably even more important is the Korean Peninsula situation. Uh, I hope for it, I mean, I hope that uh, North Korea will not launch a missile. 
I think you can see that Xi Jinping must be very happy with the 19th Party Congress that North Korea did not launch a missile, but he did launch a missile in the One Belt and One Road Summit and some of the other China's events. So um, whether you can have some real development, I mean, uh, most people are very, very cynical. And um, uh, I'm not too optimistic. But the third area is uh, more in terms of goodwill because the media will be there, although Donald Trump, I mean, is, uh, is not a good uh, friend of the media. And uh, so media will have the double negative report about the coverage about China, about Donald Trump. So that's a challenge. And unfortunately, Donald Trump will not deliver a speech. I mean, maybe he's not a good speaker or whatever, I don't know. And, uh, but the Chinese actually like to hear from him, from a business leader. And uh, not so much of an ideological, not so much of a lecture China, but with some kind of spontaneity but unfortunately it did not happen. So let's see, without that speech, whether they have some kind of, you know, kind of contact, body language, or what he said, or what he quoted, or what some events could drastically change some of the discourse. And at the moment, it's discourse about the relationship is quite negative. And uh, of course, China's uh, political situation, you know, media censorship, and, uh, and, uh, and also got a lot of people uh, or ideological indoctrination got a lot of foreigners very concerned and for good reason. So again, I mean, uh, we need to have something quite a vivid kind of image or some kind of story or some kind of a, uh, uh, remarks to touch uh, the people. In a more, it's not, you know, uh, you, you prepare, it's more spontaneous. I mean, I think there's good reason. I do believe China and United States don't want to engage uh, military war against each other. This is so insane. So with that in mind, there's a good opportunity to change the discourse. But maybe, again, I'm too naive. So this is the way to answer your question. We'll have a chance to explore all of that in some detail uh, in the coming panel. And um, fortunately, our time is up with uh, Chung Lee. I would ask you to join me in expressing our appreciation for his analysis.